Okay, it's a little after seven, so I'd like to call this meeting of the Silver Falls School District Board to order and please note attendance, Denise. For the audience, this is a work session and um, we don't normally have public comment during during our work sessions. It's just a time for the board to think and talk. So, um, start with our discussion items. Volumetric, modular construction, Stuart Emmons. Good evening. Um, I'm Stuart Emmons, and I'm with uh, Emmons Modular, and um, so I have a little uh, presentation on the to kind of do an overview about uh, modular classrooms, and then um, I have four boards here. Um, some of the text here will also be in this. To, this is just a refresher when this goes down, and the boards are um, the existing uh, existing site uh, site with. Uh, I think you might have seen the second board with uh, dem demolition. And, uh, and a third board with a conceptual uh, scheme possibility for, uh, for a site layout. So anyhow, I'll start with uh, uh, just kind of giving you an a overview. Some of, some of you have seen these. Uh, some uh, maybe you have seen a few of these uh, projects. But um, this is um, a lot of people. A lot of people think of modular classrooms as this. Uh, this was at my son's school and uh, up in Portland at Lincoln. He got his only C in uh, high school in this building. So about two years ago, I got a little upset. They had uh, you know mechanical on the outside, these little small windows and eight foot ceilings, and so a lot of people have uh, um, kind of gotten a bad taste about modular because of uh, projects like this. Um, these have been improved on. Uh, these are these classrooms are they're two classrooms side by side with you know because of because they're up off the ground they have an ADA ramp to get up to them and they're they're really standalone you can't put you can't glue classrooms together you do two and then maybe if you want another two you have to go go over on the side. Um, so I just wanted to talk about four issues. Um, cost, uh, obviously that's a really big issue. Um, is modular a lot less uh, expensive? Well, um, it's, it's about five to, um, five to 20 percent less costly. Um, and that's because of uh, re repetitive factory construction as opposed to site construction. Just a lot of, uh, lot, it's a lot more efficient way to build. Um, there's, there are a lot less change orders. Um, you know, don't maybe need to carry that much uh, contingency, uh, as much contingency, because it's like a product. When you go into the factory, it's like a, you know, one of these things, or an iPad. I mean, it's, it's designed, it's done. I mean, there's not this normal process of, you know, 80%, 85% complete drawings, and you kind of work things out in the field. You know, I, I can see that on a, on a standalone, but what about an infill like we're talking about doing here? You still have your change um, orders and... Because you're going to be tying tying a new structure in with a whole yeah. So well, this would be a two two part project. One would be um, would, the modulars would be the product, if you will, mm -hmm. and so the tie in to the existing building there would be you know there'd be that normal on site construction you know uh, you know how it is when you open something up right. uh, there are going to be unforeseens in there, and then there's going to be a remodel part too. That's same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be unforeseen. So obviously. That's a, you know, they'll need to be the normal remodel contingencies built for that. But that's a, a great question. But the, the modulars themselves going on a foundation is pretty well known. As long as they're not where they don't touch the existing building, they're just on their own foundation. They're it's a, you know, pretty solid that they're pretty well figured out. Um, and um, anything to do with time, modular is faster. It can be a lot faster. It can be, um, well, and, and that's because, uh, thank you, Al, for telling me how to spell simultaneity, but uh, <laughs> you'll see it. But um, while, the, and, uh, while the foundation is getting built, the, the classrooms are getting built. And, and uh, that's very different than, um, you know, having to build the foundation and then stick built on top of that. So there's real time savings. And then there are just a lot of things around time that, uh, you know, <coughs> The porta potty won't be there as long. Uh, the superintendent won't be there as long, and so there's savings uh, that are time related there. And it's just a, it's there's more simplicity to a modular project. 
uh, time, there's the simultaneity. I had an E right in here, but um, I still think, yeah, I'll have to go talk to the dictionary about that. Um, simultaneity is, yeah, foundation, site work, site utilities happening at the same time that the factory is building the, the classrooms. And, the, and the, in the factory, we were at a, um, Tom was there, we were at a plant, uh, Blazer, uh, down in Omsville, and they've got 100 classrooms to build. Did you hear that? <laughs> they have 100 classrooms to build before the end of August, or actually middle of August, so they can get installed. 100 classrooms, I mean, that's a lot. And um, so things go faster in a plant, uh, and that's because of repetitive uh, factory construction where you have, you know, you lay out walls, and maybe you have a lot of walls that are the same thing, so there's just that, you know, there's that repetition that really speeds things up. Oops. What did I do there? Um, I thought I'd just show you a couple of factories, um, and I'll show you the Blazer factory that we visited. This is a factory on the East Coast called Capsis. This is more of an assembly line, um, and they do uh, some classrooms and hotels. This is a hotel room, and these are um, on the East Coast. Uh, they, they do do wood, um, but they also use a lot of steel concrete um, on the East Coast as well for, uh, you know, for New York and places like that. Great idea. Thanks, Andy. And, um, and on the West Coast, we've got some really great plants on the West Coast, uh, primarily wood um, here. Can, do you know what hotel chain that was being? Built? No, that I, I don't know. Um, but hotel rooms, anything that's repetitive, I mean, if you're doing some crazy museum or something, modular doesn't make sense. But if you're doing something repetitive, so hotel chains are starting to say, this really is starting to make sense. Um, in England, they were, uh, they were doing, uh, that, that kind of started in England, and now it's going to, going to the East Coast here. But I, I'm sorry, I don't have, the, I don't have that chain. Okay. I think they, was, they were kind of quiet about that. Uh, I'm not surprised. But... Yeah, yeah. And, and even dorms, uh, you know, some housing modules that are the same. Uh, anything that's repetitive. Um, this is another plant that's up in uh, northern Pennsylvania called uh, Deluxe. And that they, they were on an old tank, I think a tank manufacturing um, plant uh, in the Second World War. There are two railroad tracks that run a quarter mile, and then on either side of this thing, and along here you have the plumbers and the electricians and the cabin makers, and it, it, we saw this at Blazer too, that it's really cool. I used to be a cabinet maker, and it's really cool to have all your tools right there in a dry environment. All of your, if you're a pipe, if you're a plumber, you have all your fittings there. Um, instead of working out of a pickup truck, you've got your own shop right by, right by the production line, and there's a lot of efficiency with that too. So, and then this is uh, one more plant before I show you the local one. Um, this is a very highly automated plant that I went to last year. I've been to about 20 plants um, in the last two years. Uh, this is called Landmark, and they uh, they have a lot of uh, you know fewer people working in the plant. It's very highly automated. All the cutting and, and assembly is is done by equipment from mostly from Germany. Um, so here we are, and uh, Silverton here. Almsville down here, um, Blazer Industries is here. There are some manufactured housing plants. Um, there's one down in Albany. There's one up in Woodburn. Um, so um, people from uh, the plant that we went to, um, people are from California are having them build things for uh, bringing back to California. Um, they're sending work not only just to uh, the Pacific Northwest, but also Hawaii and Alaska. There's a, there are big markets there, too. So um, it's, a, it's a really well-known well -known plant. Um, so these are pictures from Blazer. Um, Tom, we didn't, these I had before, um, they weren't doing that that day. So they have, we saw these metal tables, uh, or metal supported tables, so everything's done flat. <coughs> So walls are done flat, floors are done flat, and th this is how I used to work as a cabinet maker, and then you tilt things up. So it's so workmen, like this guy, instead of being 50 feet up in the air, and having, you know, in a rain uh, for today <laughs> in a lightning storm, he's, 
you know, he's sitting there and with, uh, it's a really good work environment. It's, it's a, you know, it's ergonomically good, it's safe. And so, um, so people work faster in that kind of environment. And so this is where walls get laid out, floors get laid out. Um, this was a project that was, uh, you can see there's a bit of an assembly line. Um, this was a project that was done um, last year in Blazer. Um, they do a lot of metal work as well. Um, this is a roof assembly. And um, this, um, people ask about quality. Is modular um, a lot? What if we want to get to a 50-year building? What if we were? What if we want to build a bathroom where kids are, where you know it's going to have a heavy amount of use? So um, it was kind of cool that these were getting built when we were down um, down in Omsville. These are uh, um, commercial bathrooms, and uh, I would think for a school, elementary school or middle school, this kind of level with tile and and floor drains and you know wall-mounted toilets and the whole, I mean, that's the, that's, that would be like conventional. So there's really no difference quality-wise. Um, yeah, I believe that one had a, had a cement floor, right? Um, I don't, did that? I, I know some of yours did, yeah. yeah. It did? Okay, it did. Believe it or not, you wouldn't think, you know, I was, I was kind of shocked to see that. Yeah. Was, you know, yeah, they, um, it'll they, hold up. <laughs> it's going to hold up. I mean, that's a 50-year, well, I know. With bathrooms, I don't know if any bathrooms 50 years. Well, but, but, the, but, the, but the, the structure is the floor. Is. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's, it's built to last. Yeah, and um, so it's not all wood sometimes. Uh, that in, I think in this case, did, Tom, didn't they have steel uh, perimeter frame? Yes. And then, yeah, they basically bolted it down. Yeah, so there's steel and then concrete yeah. and then build up from that. Um, yeah. It can be wood. Yeah. Um, these are. Um, Sage classrooms um, that uh, were designed at PSU about a year and a half ago. Um, they were a green build, and um, so uh, Al's firm, um, M Space, uh, was involved in this project. And these are going up to Washington, right? Um, so the Sage uh, is a different. The, this was a response to you know those double classrooms I showed you. Um, not quite as bad as the ones I showed you, but. Um, trying to get the, the space within the classroom, getting a higher ceiling height, better lighting, greener, more energy efficient, and uh, so that is uh, you know it's a good step in that direction. This was the this under construction inside of the Sage, um, clear story windows, um, cork boards, drywall, uh, white boards were going in here. Um, flooring was just being put in when we were there. And this is uh, down, this was the Sage at Greenville, and this was the Sage at um, just a rendering that done by uh, PSU. This is still a standalone uh, group of classrooms. It's what two two next to each other, just like those other those classrooms I showed you. This was the classroom. Um, that was three, oh, then you have modules. So a module is 14, 15 feet wide by um, 53 feet. I mean, in housing, they go up to 69 feet long. That, that would be sort of the maximum on a tractor trailer. But as far as the width goes, 15, 16, if you're really pushing it, is sort of the maximum. So most of the classrooms you see are two modules to, to get to 20, sometimes 14 feet to 28 feet or 30 feet wide. And that can yield about a 900, almost a 900 square foot classroom. These classrooms down at Silver Creek that I visited last, last year are three modules. And they're, they're nice inside. They've got good, you know, okay windows, good, good ceiling height. But three modules is obviously more expensive than two modules, and so these were not um, these were not inexpensive classrooms. Um, and also, the other challenge was they are only two classrooms, and then you have to go put some space in, and then two classrooms. And I've really been interested in classrooms that, um, which is what most schools are, where you can put eight and ten classrooms together and really build a. Um, build a full school out of them instead of just a few um, side classrooms. And this was um, 
a classroom that got really well known around the country. And I saw it in Washington, D.C. last year. It was on uh, display at the uh, Building Museum. Uh, Perkins and Will is a very well known um, Chicago school architect, uh, architectural firm uh, with offices around the country. And um, this is uh, two modules that are kind of shifted like this. Um, there, that's about 14 feet wide. Really good interior space. They did this butterfly roof, so that was uh, like that. You know, windows up high, and then then they had storefront in here. Um, and of course, furniture has a lot to do with the quality of the classroom too. So good daylighting, mechanical. Um, they were bringing through these soft ducts here. And uh, it had a really good feel to it. I didn't look at the price tag, but I think these these things are you know up there. And plus, it's just one classroom for with two modules, so um, so I'm a little concerned about the cost. And I don't know how many they've sold yet. Um, and then this is Project Frog. Uh, this is a group that just got a whole pile of venture capital uh, down in San Francisco, and they've been designing uh, classrooms that are three modules as well. So one module, two modules, three modules um, with this kick up. They're kind of cool looking, but again, I wonder what the price tag is. So I think there's a happy medium between that one classroom I showed you with the air conditioners on the outside and something like this, that um, uh, there's a sweet spot in the middle where, the, where you get real, a really nice classroom and it's still modular. And um, one more, this is Smart Space uh, in Lincoln, Massachusetts, done by a pretty well-known firm. Um, these, these classrooms, cost-wise, are you know, certainly not, not like those others. And um, so I wanted to kind of show you the gamut from really inexpensive to more Cadillac or whatever we would call it, Audi or something. Like that. Um, and then this is a modular, uh, I think it's all modular <coughs> school in um, Marysville, Washington. And Tom, we talked about that with Owen. Um, Owen yeah. had asked about this. How long has that been there? Has so Owen been here? Yeah, how, how long has the, the, oh, the structure been in place? Um, I'm not sure. Al, do you know that? Um, is that a couple I, of years? I'd say at least five. Oh, at least five. Okay. And uh, I haven't been here. I want to go take a look at this. It's probably um, I, the cl it's probably the classrooms probably don't have a lot of daylight. I mean, they have kind of smaller, well, a little bit smaller windows. But I think it's really a project to, that's worth looking at. And this is a project that Alt was very involved in, a STEM school up in Pasco, which is what. Did I get that wrong? You said Pasco. I said Pasco because I wrote it Pasco. Oh. Did I misspell Redmond? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go take spelling class again. Um, sorry about that. So um, this is a STEM school. Um, the classroom, uh, very large classrooms that with uh, movable partitions and so on. So a um, little bit different than what, what you would um, probably do on this campus, but um, but all modular. It's really is it all modular? There are parts. There's some stick built. It's, okay, it's, it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. Similar to what you're looking at doing. And oh yeah, this is just uh, this is not modular. This is your Mark Twain school. Familiar? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna <laughs> you Just know that to recognize. Is that your classroom? No, it was my first school. Well, you got, oh, you got it right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I've always, it was funny because uh, we have a design called Greek class that um, uh, we've had for a couple of years now, and it has a lot of similarities to the Mark Twain classroom um, as far as daylight, you know, really good daylight in here, ceiling heights, I, I like getting clear story um, windows in to bring daylight in and, and also to exit out hot air to get good natural ventilation. Um, so um, I just thought I'd put that in. So um, in my uh, when I'm not doing my day job, um, I don't know how I got involved in the opposition to the 2011 school bond, and I kind of regret I did now. But anyhow, I was one of the 2011 school bond in Portland Public Schools um, was uh, it was kind of a mishmash. It was almost like throwing. 
phone to every, you know, every school got a little something, and, and the wording, the write-up on it was, uh, um, people just didn't get it. They, they said, it feels, and there, the trust, uh, there was, wasn't a lot of trust between general public and, and our uh, Portland Public Schools at that point. I think that's, I think that's improved in the last two years, thankfully. Um, so the 2011 school bond went down um, by, it was really close, it was like 51 to 49 percent or something. And um, so I was on TV and all that. And um, I just, uh, I felt like um, not, not enough kids were being positively impacted by the school bond. So anyhow, Carol Smith, our superintendent, did a talking session for the whole summer, and um, she brought us in, and, and uh, I ended up uh, helping. I, we started um, a community or a parents group um, from all over the city, and I was part of that. We were very much involved in crafting the 2012 bond, and um, so. The dollars uh, per thousand on the 2011 bond was two dollars per thousand, and we dialed that back to a dollar ten per thousand. But the, the the amount of the bond was pretty much the same. It's just that some of it got pushed into the you know the, the second group. But it was um, say this it was a six year bond instead of a four year bond. But so the money kind of looked like it was less, but it wasn't, and and, I, and PPS and our group was really clear that you know we're not ch we're not changing the number a lot. What we were changing was the clarity of the bond and the focus. And so I wrote this at op ed a long time ago about focusing on high schools first because we got 85 schools in that large school district and that are all that all need to be s s torn down or, or I mean they're all in in pretty tough shape. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance that hasn't deferred maintenance on them. So, um, so we decided to do the, the high schools first, and everybody. We had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the public weighing in on that, and everyone said, you know, that makes sense. Um, I get that. We're going to hit more. We're going to impact more kids if we go for. In our, it, this is just specific. I'm just giving one example. In our case, we wanted to hit um, those groups. So, uh, and then we would do the, the elementaries and the. Uh, the middle schools and the K-8s uh, and, the, and the subsequent bonds. But the writing of the bond was really much clearer. And, and you, could, you could do an elevator, you could go down an elevator three floors and explain the whole bond in 2012. And uh, we had um, the west side, um, you know, we have this east side, west side thing in Portland. And the west side didn't get a lot of, uh, they got less uh, than they did in the 2011 bond, but they under, they said this makes more sense citywide, and we got way more West Side votes on the 2012. <coughs> so the long and short of it is 2012 bond got 67 percent. We won big, and uh, it was really exciting. We're doing three high schools now, one one K8, and um, so now we're I'm on the bond committee for the 2016 bond, and we've got a perform for the 20, we've got to get stuff built, and you know, we're talking about you know, making sure the 2012 bond is done successfully. We have really good management of that bond, um, you know, not just on time, on budget, but working towards uh, 21st century schools and other goals for the district. And so this is going to be a 30-year uh, program to rebuild as many schools as possible. So that's uh, that's what we did up north. I know banks on a smaller scale um, has that, but I guess the, what what we learned from our bond was just uh, just be straight with people and just you know make it really clear about the goals of the bond. And uh, you know people want to help kids. And they don't want to you know and you don't need you know don't need to win by 100%. Um, but we were really happy with 67%. And we had I don't know how many people. Households without children in the school system it was like 80 percent. So, and then that's just me, hopefully not getting a module. Uh, that was a modular installation we did last year on a project in East Portland. Okay, so um, that's that. Can I just shut this off? Can we turn the lights on? How am I doing on time? Too much. Okay. Um, okay, so.
switches to these three boards here. So I think you've seen this. You didn't see all these pretty colors I put on the existing building. But um, that's the Schlater campus as, as it is now. And then this would be the Schlater campus if we were to take out the uh, 1938 building and the wood shop and the uh, ag metal shop in this area. And that leaves um, approximately 200, uh, about 240 feet uh, length in here and so on. So just for the heck of it, we decided to um, test it against uh, See how many once, and this is a one-story solution. Looking at can we, how many classrooms can we get get in here um, that really fit comfortably? Um, so this is a single load. This is just a concept. There are a lot of ways to solve this problem, but this is a single load classroom here, and double loaded classrooms. Maybe maybe a couple of labs that are a little bit bigger in there. So these are seven classrooms uh, times three uh, for. 21, um, if you're thinking about a grade, uh, either middle school or elementary school, I don't know, six, six classrooms per grade, five classrooms per grade, something like that. And um, we were, back to when we crafted our bond measure, I know a lot of people look at 1960s, 19, late 1950s classrooms and walk into them and say, what's wrong with this? Why, why can't you just reuse it? And um, so you can, um, obviously, with energy and seismic and um, ADA and um, you know uh, just mechanical, electrical systems. Um, there's got to be a lot of work <coughs> to them, uh, roofing, uh, exterior skin, and so on. But um, I, you know, I, I, I think the cost per square foot would be less than new construction. <coughs> taking a look at so, and I, you know, I know, the, I know the charter school is is there now or over there now that's a possible um, tenant if you want to call them that um, we've got a great gymnasium here um, bathrooms maybe need some upgrading for just because they're old older and also ada says they probably need to need some work um, but uh, maybe they could that these buildings can there could be new life breathe into these um, the admin life or this, uh, this area, these classrooms are oversized. They're kind of over a 1,000 square feet with good daylight and so on. So maybe that's a good combination. <clears throat> what do you think? So when you did your bond, did you use the modules? No, because the first bond, that's a good question. The first bond's going to be, we're going after the two or the three I don't know why I did this, but going after the three toughest high schools, and they're all historic. So, um, so they were. Uh, it was Grant Franklin. If you're familiar with Portland schools, Grant Franklin and Roosevelt. So, um, so they're going to just focus on mostly. Um, there'll be a little bit of new, but it's going to be mostly historic remodel, which is really, you know, it's going to be tough. It's going after the hard stuff first. And so, the, hopefully, the next bonds, yes. The difference with the modules, the the cost to do it with modules, you say, is only five to twenty percent less than if we did stick build. Is that correct? Yeah, that you know, it's hard to um, if you're if you're putting a certain quality of carpet in and a certain ceiling type or something. That's going to be the same no matter what you do, whether it's module or conventional. Um, so a lot of that um, savings is if you want to say. Uh, I'm going to do. I want. I want it to be a 50-year building. So the savings come from anything time-based and from that repet repetition in a factory. So if you're doing a lot of classrooms, um, and it's just like a mass-produced item. Uh, the more you do, the you know, more efficiencies you get. Can you speak to the quality a little bit more? Mm -hmm. well, can, can can we build a? Can we expect a modular-built building to be the quality of, say, this room here? Well. Um, I'm a little biased, um, and I'm a that's fine. I'm a wood shop boy, and I, I like building things with a roof over me. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, I took that in my slideshow. Maybe I did. Um, so I was driving by a, 
this condominium project in, in a fancy area. It wasn't affordable housing. It was luxury con luxury condominiums. And on Saturday morning, uh, the, like the third month of constant rain, right in the middle of the winter, and they're putting REM strand board out there. I just, I, I, you know, here it is, 2014, and we're building, um, we're building buildings, uh, wood frame buildings, or uh, with exterior walls and all that outside in the elements, and I, I've never understood that. I, I think that, you know, I think you get a better quality product if you build it inside and then went, and then protect it and then bring it out. So um, I, I personally think modular is higher quality. I think with, uh, because of the elements, because of just work, it's a better work environment. It's a safer work environment, but, you know, with workers, I mean, I've been out there, maybe some, <laughs> Cutting out there 30 feet up in the air with a skill saw, you're not thinking about eighths of an inch, you're thinking about how, to get, how am I going to get home? <laughs> um, I think that impacts quality mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the end product. But you're the same, same input, so you use the same type of materials we would on a stick build. Um, That's what I saw. I didn't see any chipboard up there anywhere. Yeah, same. I was almost thinking so by 10, see higher eights. quality. Was, yeah. Yes. And, and you might, so, oh, and uh, could I just throw one more thing in? So these things need to move down the road, mm -hmm. which is a good thing because they've got to be built for vibration and, 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 and transportation as well. So they're a little bit overbuilt sometimes, so, um, so they can make that, that trek. And uh, that's a, you know, that's an advantage. So that answers part of my question. And the savings really is in the assembly line production that uh, time. rather than, yeah, exactly. Well, that saves time. I mean, that saves enormous amount of time. It's it really does. Henry yeah. Ford's concept. You know, and which, prevailing wage. Right. Yeah, um, and, and wages. Yeah, but the travel, uh, the travel issue, that doesn't impact the quality of what's delivered to the site. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I, I think because of what I just said, probably improves the quality because they have to stay on that. So they're not, they're not, they haven't been damaged. They haven't been shaken apart, or the integrity of them compromised in some way by making the trip. No, that's a that's a really good question, and and um, I've been I've been in a lot of modular projects, and some were not braced well enough. And there's, the, the idea is to, to minimize site work, to have, there's going to be maybe a little bit of cracking around and you might have to touch up with the paint, but the, the less work you do on site, the better, and that's what they should be designed for, because that's where you get, some, that's where you get your savings to. How does it work um, with the building currently there? You're you know, working back and forth between modules and the current style of the building, yeah. and it doesn't sound like there's much in the way of adjustments for the modules. You just kind of, how does that work? Well, um, to make them kind of you know mesh together and become one. <laughs> pre -planning. Uh, is there you know, adjustments in the modules enough that you can really do specific? There's something about the Schlater campus. I'm gonna sound like I'm. <laughs> you know, the classrooms at the Schlater campus with this with the. Car, uh, hallway, the walkways, and all that are could have been modular. There, there's a, there's a, this, this design is Oma has a lot of similarities to these classrooms that are already here. Um, so as far as fitting in, um, you know, I've looked at this, this side, this elevation really carefully, and you know, when that gets cleaned up, it's just, you know, and, and also this elevation here, this el, this elevation. <clears throat> would have a lot to do with these two elevations, and maybe we could even um, we get something in the budget to do that, uh, put some brick from, I mean, either you could reuse brick, and that's obviously tedious, or you could have, have some brick incense between the windows. So uh, it's not gonna look like you drove a trailer in here. It's gonna, I think it's gonna look really good and, and fit in with the, with the uh, existing school buildings in this case. What about warranty? Is it the same as the stick bill? Ten, ten year? Um, you want to answer that? Yeah. It would be up to the general Yeah. Okay. So, All right. so it should be. Say the same. Yeah. 
And what and design for, for these types type of buildings? Do we go through the same type of design process, or, or is it is is it it's different? It's kind of different. That? It's kind of different. It's like a product. Um, again, it's uh, you know it's, I I I I, uh, I went to modular after having done conventional for 20 years, so I, I know the whole process with conventional. You hire an architect, and then. Um, and then you know how it works. They draw up uh, construction documents, so then you put it out to bid. Mm -hmm. um, the documents, uh, there's no such thing as a perfect set of documents. So those documents on a good day are, I don't know, 90, 92%. Um, things are, a lot of stuff's worked out in the field, and then of course you have your unforeseen as, as well. Um, these are, these drawings are a lot more baked. Um, the pipes are figured out. Um, the engineering is just it's a, at a higher level um, and at, a, at an earlier stage um, with this. So, um, so the process is more design in the beginning. So, which is always less expensive, but it's all. I mean, you, all your stuff's worked out on paper. I mean, I've been in one of my first projects when I got out of grad school was, you know, we had a. Uh, these change orders, we had concrete walls that were in the wrong place, and you know um, that just the likelihood of that happening or a lot less on on, on modular um, because it's uh, it's done. So then when you go into the construction process, uh, I mean, going about, I would put a crawl space underneath these. So um, you know a lot. Of, a lot of modules you see, they put a skirt around it or something. There's not a lot of access. I would have a full access crawl space. So over 50 years, you know, something's going to change. There's going to be some low voltage thing we don't even know about needing to come in or plumbing needs to get reworked. And um, so, um, am I, how, how am I doing on your question? Uh, so that so that process would be. Um, so it's a, it's just cleaner. There, there's more. Um, the drawings will be tighter when when you go into construction. Less, so do you do we use a standard architect faster. architecture firm to do the design work, or is that under the direction of and under the umbrella of the um, a blazer? In this case? Well, I I do modular design now. I, I think uh, I've seen modular done by I you know it's a, it's a different thing because that higher level of engineering. So um, I, I, in this case, um, I would probably have a modular architect um, who was familiar with classrooms um, do this and then, and then have a Okay, um, so you'd be specialized in type of work. Yeah, yeah, I think you'll get, I mean, you could do it the other way, but I think you'll get your best, best product out of it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I have a question about, yeah. um, uh, if, if you look, if you go online and research modulars and the history of modular classroom construction, uh, right up to the present, <clears throat> there appears to be a great deal of concern uh, across the country uh, about air quality and specifically about off-gassing because of the glues mm -hmm. and uh, materials, the formaldehyde in particular, and a number of other chemicals that are used in this type of construction. Can you speak to that? Yeah, well, that's it's the same as conventional. Um, uh, we just did a project uh, with Blazer where we, you know, have no off-gassing because it's all in the selection of, I mean, that was all in specifications that we put out for the, so I would just write that into the specifications about no no VOC or low, and, and all the materials are, are sunk to that. I mean, that's, you'd have to do that. But that's a really good question. I, I'd say no difference between modular and conventional for anything, anything green materials. So just from my perspective, which is far away, are we looking at uh, potentially 21 classrooms in the space that you're proposing to infill? The green space. What what are we what are we seeing there? Could you explain that to us? Um, and, and if these, the, my second second part of my question is is if these are modules that are placed in here, how many are there? And since they're squeezed together, how would you address the issue of natural light coming into these? Okay. Is it, or is that something you can speak to right now? Um, yeah, I thought, I thought about it. Okay. Um, this was just a test to see what could fit in the footprint of of this, the 1938 building. Um, could you put another 
group of classrooms in here, uh, it's getting kind of tight. Um, so this is exactly where this building is, and this is exactly, this has a hallway, that existing 10-foot um, hallway is right in here, so there's a little bit of space in there. So, um, so seven fits comfortably. Uh, classrooms are about 900 square feet. These are 15-foot wide modules, and, and I think that's a pretty comfortable fit. Um, I don't think I'd put eight in here. Uh, as far as natural light, um, this goes back to um, you know the different kinds of you. I, I try to show some classrooms with little bitty windows, other classrooms with a lot of windows. Can you do both in modular? Absolutely, you can. Um, so I would. Um, we have south here. Um, I I would have you know really good a really good amount of windows on these on these fronts here. Um, it's potential to even have clear story windows to bring daylight in. I'm kind of a, you know, I, as far as just being green and using less energy, uh, the more daylight you have in there, it's good psychologically, but it's good for energy as well. Um, so I think you could get really good daylighting into these classrooms, unlike some of the classrooms I showed you that are, I've been in some, the ones that Lincoln were, in these windows were, <laughs> there were two of them in a classroom. So, um, so I think they'll feel really good, and and uh, you know the, these classrooms they have pretty small windows, um, but in these classrooms and these the windows are quite a bit bigger, and you can you can see when everything were opened up in these classrooms they have pretty good daylight. So, um, in these face north that way, so maybe there's a courtyard between them that would bring daylight in too. I think well, the reason I ask that is not so much about um, environmental, you know, other environmental concerns, but there's a great deal of uh, study and literature about uh, the importance of abundant natural light and in terms of learning, the optimum learning environment. So uh, the, the, mod right. the yeah. modules that I'm most familiar with are the old boxes with little windows and the, new uh, day. the ones that we see everywhere still today that are rotting away. So. I mean, the ones that you're seeing too are designed to be temporary. Mm -hmm. um, PPS bought what two two years ago, two point four million dollars worth of these classrooms. That I mean, on a good day, they're going to last ten years, and then they use them until sixteen years. They're moldy. They're bad. They're, they're just not good learning spaces. And every every year is an important year for every, for our kids, and it's important that we get it right the first time. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. Sure. So on your on your diagram there, the green to the right of the green, that's the that's an existing hall, the existing hallway that's already there. Um, later. Yeah, I kind of added on to it just just because yeah. I thought it had some extra space. Yeah. And maybe this could be a, a commons area. So um, it's tied into the and this would get tied into the module. So the, the corridor right it. now is right there. That's the line. Oh, okay. Okay. And, it's got I mean, nice you, you can see it right there, right there. Oh, okay. I, mm -hmm. yeah, I get it. It's, uh, it's somewhat adjacent to the kitchen, so you can have outdoor eating right there, too. Yeah, right, yeah. right. I mean, you could, you know, you could put a it's terrace nice out there and eat outside, which would be fantastic. Oh, that's good. Then how is it, is it tied in the same way on the other side, then? Um, is that the... Yeah, the tie-ins the tie here would be, uh, well, this this might be some new conventional construction <coughs> here, and this would be, um, I don't know, I, I, I maybe would keep, uh, I would keep uh, one eye to not, not put it tight against the gym, maybe put a light cord in there with plants, uh, with daylight coming in, it would, it would bring daylight into this area, um, be kind of a nice walkway. There's precedent for that on the campus already. And also just functionally, you wouldn't have to worry about flashing into uh, 20, however tall they are, 25 foot high tilled up walls. Um, and then in, in this area, the tie-in would be, um, let's see, that, that's against an outdoor walkway. And so the only little bit of a tricky tie-in would be in that area. Oh, I but see, okay. I'm not, it's, I'm not real worried about that. Yeah. You talked about this being a single story. Any restrictions if you want to do a two story? Um, no, I mean, uh, it, it, it would impact the, uh, I mean, we, so these classrooms would have slope ceilings to get, um, modular has one limitation. Of course, if these were built locally, I didn't really mention that, but, you know, at Marysville they did this. Uh, Marysville has a plant 
within what 10 miles or something now if they're of the school were what 20 15 miles from Homsville. Um, so there's a height restriction because uh, we don't want classrooms uh, getting caught up on bridges. <laughs> so um, so there's so there's that height restriction. But so if you did one story, you can kind of maximize it, angle angle the ceiling. If you did two story, obviously you have to do a flat ceiling uh, for the first floor, a little less daylighting, be able to get in there. And then the only thing with two story is that. Um, if you do two-story, you have uh, obviously exiting issues um, with uh, even grades one through three. I mean, daycare, you need probably be on the first floor, but one through three and then up to middle school, that would be okay to do on the second floor. But you have staircases, ADA, el elevators. If you split it up like this, uh, do you have one elevator or two elevators? Sure. Um, and then obviously uh, fire, fire egress coming there. So. You know, you're you're adding more square footage just to just for circulation for the stairs and elevators and structures a little bit more too. And some of our conversations have been whether this will be a grade school or a middle school. Yeah. And would that design change depending on which one it was? Probably a little bit. Um, you know, the labs. Their experience, you know, kind of with what is needed for more of a middle school and what's more needed for a middle school. Yeah, I, I mean, a little bit. The size, the size would be the same, but I think the way the interior was done, I might want to tweak it a little bit from what middle school would be. But it'd be close. So, Stuart, if you was to set this on a concrete foundation, is it the same dimension as a traditional stick built, eight inch? Thick wall, six inch, or what are you talking about? Um, the only difference is this was sort of fun on our project last year. Um, I'm kind of a, because I'm a cabinet maker, I, I used to talk 30 seconds of an inch, and uh, our language was different when we laid the concrete out. Um, we weren't talking about every half inch. <laughs> I mean, we were precise. We were, uh, and we went, we, went to the factory and back to the site. So what we were within, uh, we were talking in a range, but we were actually within an eighth of an inch on, on, the found, on the whole foundation, all the concrete work, and also the diagonals, the squareness of it. So uh, yeah, I, I'd probably go eight, probably not six on that. And, uh, and then of course, when you've got seismic hold downs, so we were, we were so coordinating the site team with the uh, factory team is really key, and we had some uh, interesting. We took our whole team down to Omsville, and we you know, we remeasured the bolts, so we had every bolt going in accurately, and we had a really clean install because of that. So the foundation, the precision on the foundation is different than because you need the the box in the factory, and the, and the foundation needed to be spot on, and there's no reason why people can't do that, and, and they sure did it with us, and everybody got. Did a really good job with this. Are you familiar with Butler type buildings? A little bit. Is would the look and feel be similar to a Butler building? Or? I've only been in one Butler building. Um, I I, I, I want to say these will feel stronger. Okay. They they will be stronger than the, certainly the Butler building I went in. Okay. I mean, just the frequency of the studs and. All those things. I mean, you're not going to be. I mean, everyone thinks that the floors are going to be bouncing or something. It's not true at all. It's, it's as sturdy as conventional. So you would consider this a permanent solution, not Absolutely. a temporary solution. Absolutely. And These that are... you couldn't move it once you were done. <clears throat> Well, I, there's been talk that oh we'll do a temporary let's put a few modules in here and then we'll move them you know and this yeah. is not an option with this is that correct I mean you, you could move what <laughs> that's a, like a no, no. <laughs> you can say no <laughs> uh, no I just want to make it clear that that it would be a permanent solution it's not a temporary solution because people are have come and talked saying oh let's do this just for a short period of time and get through. Yeah, so well, I think it's important to clarify that. In Portland, we're sitting on $2.4 million of, you know, 10-year-old maybe on a good day, temporary solutions, and then what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. So this is definitely 50-plus years. I think that's a good way. I think it's a good way to go. And do it. 
So, why is it only 50 years? I'm just putting that out there. I think it is. I think it's more. Well, that doesn't years. sound good. I mean, you know, if it's if it's as good as traditional, it should be a hundred years. Right? Yeah. It's, it's the same as traditional, okay. conventional. Okay. Yeah. But isn't it, it's, it's the case, I think, that this sort of the standard, the universal standard is your building for 50 years. I think that that was what was said to us when we built the high school. Yeah. It's a 50-year yeah. building. That's, that's a number that's... We hope it's paid. much longer than that, given yeah. the cost, but it's... And it will be if it's maintained well. Right. <laughs> it's all about the roof and... As long know, as that's a standard. Yeah. Once yeah, water's not getting in the skin... Throw that number out. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like your car's good for 100,000 yeah. miles, but if you change the oil, right. you know, you'll, you'll go a lot farther. Well, I just wanted the public to know that you know we're not building something just for right. 50 years because... Yeah, no, this exactly. is permanent. Yeah. This yeah. is as good as a building and permanent building. Now, Stuart said when I was up there that you know you can spec them out however you want, but what we were seeing, I mean, it had it had steel door frames like what you see there, see right there. Yeah, they're hardware, solid hardware. I mean, yeah. it was it was like what you see in, a, in, in the, the the hardware in the modulars we saw was the same hardware you saw that's in the new high school. Yep. I've run out of questions. <laughs> Everybody have yeah. any questions? Yeah. yeah, so any more questions? Yeah, I got a question about bonds. You yeah. got a bond committee up there. Yeah. You said, now you, you got one in 2012, you passed. Uh -huh. And you're going to go, how long is that one going to go on for? How long, how long to pay that one off? Uh, I think we're at six years. Six years. Then you're going to do notes. it again. We kind of, and okay. then we're going to do an overlap. So our goal is every presidential election, we're going to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we picked that, or maybe uh -huh. we should pick linear terms. Maybe that's better. Um, we, uh, we, we like getting more voters to the polls. We kind of felt in our case that that was helpful. Um, but we're going to get up to two dollars per thousand on the second bond. So they're kind of, we came up with this brick concept um, that we could go dollar ten per thousand for the first bond, and then um, and then the second bond would come in before the first bond was done, and we would go to two dollars and stay at two dollars for pretty much thirty years. And uh, we've seen precedent with that two dollar number. Uh, Duke Beaverton just um, passed. I don't know, what were they? Were they? They were. It was a huge bond. Yeah, that was a huge bond. Were yeah. they like six hundred and something yeah, over six hundred? And we were at four eighty-five. So, um, and they passed that. So, yeah. but they had a good story. Yeah, you took. Can you tell? You, you mentioned um, the a um, uh, uh, thirty-year plan, and you're starting with elementaries. I think right now you uh, said high, high schools. School. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just speak a little bit about that? About the plan and what your. You know, <clears throat> Well, the plan, you know, school boards change, so yes, uh, yes. and uh, so I, I, I wrote this article, do all the high schools in the first bond, and of course <laughs> I got some tomatoes thrown at me, um, <laughs> because that would have been a lot of money. Um, so we kind of settled in on, and we've got, um, depends on what day it is, because we just got demographics and found out we're going to have 5,000 more kids in the school system in whatever it is, eight years. And mm -hmm. two years ago, a short two years ago, we were, we were focusing on closing. Do we close another high school? And now, oh my goodness, we've got to open up more high schools. So, um, sorry, I'm rambling here. No, no, but yeah, but but, you're, but you guys, you guys kind of have so, a plan. Yeah, so we do have a plan. We're going to do yeah. three high schools, and 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 you know the groups change, so that's yes. what I was trying to get yeah, at. Yeah, and, yeah. And you know, do we really want to keep going with high schools? And I'm on this on the bond committee this time. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're sticking to high schools, so we're going to do three, three, and three, and we're going to do K eight here that. Uh, with, uh, that makes some sense, maybe, and some roofs and seismic and labs, mm -hmm. a little bit, but not tons, and then do all the high schools, and then we're going to go after the, and then we'll go into K-8s and elementary after that. And that's the plan. And I think that's probably what's going to end up <clears throat> happening. And people really got, when we wrote the bond, <clears throat> really got into that we had a plan for going, you know, going Full forward. Up, yeah. The 2011 Bond didn't have a plan. It, I mean, a future plan. It just sort of said, "We're doing this, and then we'll see what happens afterwards." So, so that brings up another question. Um, say, ten years down the road, we need more space. Can we put something into the planning, like on those rooms on the end, that we could double stack six more rooms? 
and to put stairways on the outside into the deck. Um, well, I mean, this is true on conventional too. Building on top of something, um, even if you plan for it, it's been done a few times, but seismic codes change. And so usually if you're going to plan for expansion, do it vertically or what is horizontally and don't put it on top of something. Um, so, I mean, there's it's a pretty big piece of property. Um, and maybe there are... Uh, Classrooms that could be admin now that could be switched over to classrooms later. Or there's some space in here, or um, but this is uh, I, I this wouldn't go into a two-story scheme at a later date. Do it up front if you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, build it two-story right away because seismic. Who knows what seismic codes and that's the main thing. I mean, maybe fire life safety will be different. Maybe three staircases instead of two. Who knows? Containers. Can you speak to your, your role? We, we got you know we got the general contractor, we got Blazer Industry. Yeah. How how where do you? Fulfill? Well, I I personally design modular, um, so I would design this, and I'm really into I'm I'm really into this whole pipeline thing, streaming streamlining the pipeline so you get the most efficiency. So you'd be an architecture and engineering. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, when I I like to write who who does what. To who? Uh, spreadsheets. It's sort of a joke, but um, what what the site contractor does, and this is what Al uh, Doer works on. Rules responsibilities. Who does what? Yeah. And that's if you can get those two right, it really works uh, well. But I've seen projects where they didn't do that, and then it can be you know can add costs because you know everybody's finger pointing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to work around that. Can we can we jump back just for a second yeah. to Portland Public and their yeah. their bond their bond strategy bond request strategy? Yeah. It's my understanding. I know some of the members of your board of directors there, and it's my understanding that kind of their approach now is instead of asking for one great big bond uh -huh. for a really long range plan, they have a plan in place uh, for a long range, and they're asking for smaller bonds with greater frequency. Is that correct? That's correct. Every every, four, so, every four years. So then the public sees what's been accomplished with right. the previous relatively sure small bond, right. right? And you keep the rates down that way, uh, pretty yeah. much. I mean, you know, as opposed to a great big bond like Beaverton bond. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, uh, so. I don't think we could have gotten at that last uh, the 2012 election. I don't think we could have gone to two dollars and. I don't know. You know, I, I don't think it was all about the money. I think it was about the story. Yeah. I think that that had something to do with it. Thanks. Sure. Other questions? I'm trying to think. <laughs> this has been very helpful. Yeah, this has been very thanks. informative. Yeah, thanks for. Did much. you have any? Did you have anything, Andy? No, I, I okay. think your questions have been great, and okay. good, good having Tom and Owen involved with the tour the other day, and I think uh, Stuart has done a nice job of presenting the information to you. Thanks, and I, I'm really glad I got to work on those two bonds, um, because it kind of uh, opened up possibilities and how to, how to win bonds, and, and how, how the perception, it's not just perception, but you know that we're, we're, we're really being <coughs> conscious of our taxpayers' dollars, and, and um, Building a you know long long term project uh, that will last for many many decades. I have one other question: the funding for modules, like yeah. banks or whatever, is it very cool. different than stick belt? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a little different. Um, so, um, yeah, in a typical construction, it's uh, you know percent completes. So uh, you know, get draws every however long the project is. In that case, it's like 14 months or something. With modular, um, um, it's uh, I'm just gonna take a crack at this, but I've heard so Al, if you want to. Um, so third, third, right up front, third kind of 40% um, percent. In a public it's works it's contract, yeah. it's just like a public works, the way money is dispersed. Okay, that's fair enough. It's, so, yeah, you might see a little bit more money. Well, and also it's faster, so you're not going to be out 14 months writing checks. Uh, um, you'll have the product sooner. So, so the cash flow is a little bit. It's fair to say it's a little different. A little different. 
and the rest of the project would be traditional cash flow. Because it's slow. <clears throat> Other questions? No, I just come. I I, um, I enjoyed the tour, and I bet I would probably give anybody a tour if they wanted to again. I mean, it's not too far away. I mean, it was I was down the street. Yeah, I was I was impressed with the quality. I'm just glad they're doing covered bridges between here and Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> you like moving the spruce. <clears throat> right, right. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very yeah, much, Stuart. This is very very helpful. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, moving on. November bond election proposed action plan and timeline. Andy put this in our packet. Dates, that kind of action plan for when things need to get done in order to make a, a November bond election. Do you want to start off, start us off on this one, Andy? Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. There's uh, the dates on the left with the. Uh, description of the action, and then I, I did put a call in there for responsibility, and uh, it's intended to be a, a document that can be adjusted over time, depending upon uh, additional information that you determine, or, or a different additional direction that you go, uh, but I, I, it does give you a, uh, a continuum uh, with required <coughs> elements that would need to be in place uh, in order to have uh, a bond on the ballot for November 4th. And, as you've discussed in the past, it's it's, a, it's an aggressive timeline. In, in my mind, it's a manageable timeline, uh, but it does uh, it does address a number of items uh, over over a short period of time. And, uh, and so, I appreciate any input that, that you any of you would have uh, uh, related to this timeline, what it what it could look like, uh, and, and there could be some omissions, uh, something that maybe you say, well, I wonder where this is, or or you may have some questions specific to some of these descriptions. Well, I, I, I'll just pipe up here with my previous reiteration of my previous comment. I think scarcely more than five months and two weeks uh, is an extremely, extremely aggressive timeline, especially to build public support for something like this. So I guess that's my initial thought. I think it's... It, it is, a, it is a, a quick timeline, but I think it's doable, very doable, because of the fact that a lot of the work has already been done from the last bond, from the work on the last bond, as far as, um, you know, figures, and there's just been a lot of work done. And uh, I feel like we're miles ahead with the public support already <coughs> for, a, for on the positive side of the bond. I think we're miles ahead of where we were last time for the public support just because of the energy behind the group from Eugene Field and I've just heard a lot of people talking about this who I didn't hear talking about it last time and so I think there's more I think there's more knowledge out there I think we've done a better job already in informing the public of of the situations and kind of where we're headed I think we've done a much better job up to this point and I think we will continue that especially with the backing of the like the group from Eugene Field and, and um, support that way I think I think it's doable I think I was I was encouraged to see that Portland had a bond in 2011 and failed and they went back in 2012 and got it passed because they they just change our approach a little bit. And I think we've all, that's something we've already done, I think. So. Yeah, I agree. I think it's doable. I, th I think there are a lot, a lot of opportunities to uh, run into some roadblocks. But I think we as a board need to be committed to, if we, if, if we run into those situations, we'll have to have Denise all of this some extra meetings to, to try to get through them so we can stay, stay on the overall timeline. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very doable. I think we should go for it. I also think, though, that the sooner we get an exact plan, you know, who's yeah. going where, and do yeah. that within the next month so that we can get it out there. So we can, but I do think there's momentum. I do think there's a lot of good support out there. But if we don't have that exact plan here in the next month or so, 
then they can't work with anything to help out getting that bond passed. Yeah, so I right. think that's where really our focus needs to be. You know, we have quite a few options, but I think we need to really set and focus on those options. Are we moving straight over here to Schlater? You know, are we leapfrogging? You know, are we using modules, not using modules? I, those are some things that we need the cost for and move forward, and I think that's the most sensitive, that's what we need to focus on now. I think we're, most of us are pretty much in agreement that a bond should happen, but if we don't have the exact what needs yeah. to happen, then we won't have the support like we need. And having a, I think, bringing a project manager on will help a lot to, to speed up that process to get to that point, too, because they'll be able to focus, to focus more on that and direct, you know, direct a little bit, I think. Show us options and yeah. package them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree, uh, Julie. That was well said. So, yeah. Do we need to take action on this and adopt it at the end, or is this just a? No, I, I, I think you know, there are a few action items on there, just as you, you move along. One of them, yeah. tonight is one of them related to the, the program manager, and I, and I think that's uh, that's valuable input as well. So we, we do need to get someone on board who can help take all of the information that you have, put it together in a package, put it on in side by side comparison, so you can make not only informed decision, but you can uh, we can appropriately inform the but uh, to the community uh, what uh, what those figures are. Julie, really very good point. I appreciate you putting this together, Andy. We, we need a plan for us moving forward and uh, basically a map things out for us. And if you don't have a schedule, typically you don't hit it because you don't know what you're driving sure. to, and this, yeah. this gives us something to drive to. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is very good because we, we are at the point we just need to move forward, push forward, and get this done. Oh, I was going to have one more question for Module Man, but I think you left. I saw him. I saw him. <laughs> Just wondering how quick it was, how much quicker it was for the modules to be built to that moment. Well, he's still here. Is he still His computer's still here. Is yeah. it? <laughs> 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 back. <laughs> Just how much that time frame would change for building. We can move on with the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, we don't want to lose the thought. <laughs> Any other discussion on the action plan timeline? Okay. I think you should feel comfortable modifying that every time you meet to see if there are, yeah. there are needs. Yeah. That yeah. 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 As far as extra meetings, we have our next work session next week. Um, and you had a tentative one for the 30th. That. Let's all keep that in mind as a possibility. Mm -hmm. I think once we get the project manager on, we'll know more if we need that or if it's a little too soon to mm -hmm. start looking at specifics. Yeah, it depends if you have data, data for us. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, I do want to comment that uh, you see on the 25th that we have a community root school in, in Silver Falls Board uh, planning planning meeting, uh, and I appreciate Julie and, and Owen stepping forward to be willing okay. to go out to represent you. Uh, and I see Brian is here. Yeah, Brian is here. Jose, uh, so community rich representation I know is very attentive the whole time, and so there I'm, I'm sure very curious to get going to. Yeah, I have a question for you, Stuart. Yes, uh, I was sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering. I know, thank you. Um, I was just wondering how much um, quicker it really would be to do the modules as opposed to stick belt. Um, well, uh, the modular portion, um, if it's well managed. Um, I mean, it's a lot quicker. I mean, can we do it over the summer? Does it take six months, or you know, I'm like. Well, you've got to you've got to remodel to deal with too. Mm -hmm. messy, the messy remodel that's going to take time. A lot of a lot of schools, a lot of schools choose and colleges choose modular dorms because they can do the prep in spring break and build it on during the summer and, and install it and finish it out during the summer. So um, to do, I mean. Um, I mean, spring, summer breaks pretty quick, so I, I don't know if you can do the whole foundation and all that, uh, but I think you do the foundation during spring break and, and do the install during the summer and have it ready as long as you get there right, right at June. 
Um, so that's June, July. So what's that? Three and a half months or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, we don't. It's it's three we don't necessarily have to focus on on school schedule. Yeah, calendar, right? vacant. Most of it's vacant. Yeah. yeah right, right. Right. But then you 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 got some dominoes too behind it. So mm -hmm. um, that obviously probably yeah. need to get factored in too. But um, um, the remodel will take how long? A remodel is going to take. It's going to be less remodeling. Um, you're going to do remodel the 1938 drilling. That would take quite a bit longer. So, did that so? If you're really cruising, I, I don't. I don't think people have gotten to fifty percent construction time yet. But you know, sixty percent of the construction time, so savings of forty percent. Um, so I'm doing a good team working on it. Okay. okay. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Any other discussion items? Nope. Okay, actions. Approve resolution for use of district purchase cards. Scott talked briefly about this. Scott, would you just, I mean, for my benefit for one, would you want to just kind of give us a summary? Of what Purchasing card is uh, just a, a more efficient way of making purchases on behalf of the school district that eliminates a tremendous amount of paperwork. Um, currently, if a person wants to, a teacher wants to purchase a uh, a book for a classroom, uh, that individual asks the district the building secretary to, to build a requisition, um, and that requisition is passed to us on a piece of paper, it is checked against the budget, then it is approved through the computer system, then the purchase order is created, that's also done on a piece of paper, then that purchase is made via that purchase order on a piece of paper, um, then, then that creates the order, then the order comes in, and then the invoice, we all have to be invoiced against anything that we buy on a purchase order. And and so the, the length of time um, and the amount of time and the amount of paper, particularly, that gets happened for a book purchase or any smaller purchase in particular is, is quite extensive. We typically figure it's going to be about 30, 45 days to get a, the whole purchase cycle completed. So um, from, from concept to actual check in the vendor's hands. Um, what purchasing cards do is essentially pre-authorize a certain amount of purchasing power for the teacher. In this case, it would be uh, textbooks. Uh, they would get pre-authorized for an amount, let's say $50 to buy a textbook. Um, and then they would charge a, a, a Visa or a MasterCard branded card. And that person, the teacher, would be able to purchase a textbook using a variety of approved vendors but only buying a textbook. Um, so that person could then use a, a credit card. Then the vendor is happier because they get paid much sooner. Um, and then, then for us, it eliminates you know, all the miles and reiterations of the paper because we have one statement that we reconcile against. The control factor is there because we have the ability to control how much is placed on that card, and then also who has that card uh, in their possession, as well as um, we get uh, email alerts when the purchase is made and the transaction is made. So it eliminates the opportunity for fraud when somebody else, if somebody grabs it and takes it to a different store and tries to buy something else. Much like when you run your credit card at a restaurant or something, there's a pre-approval process that kind of waits for a second. If you are in a if you're buying office supplies, for instance, and you're trying to put gas in your car, the card itself would reject that purchase. So, oh, well, well. yeah, it's uh, okay. it's not new. It's uh, purchasing cards have been around for a long time, and, uh, but larger districts tend to use them more than, than smaller districts. But I think when I came here and looked at the size of our purchasing volume and the amount of purchases that we make and the variety of vendors that we use. Um, and, you know, because we try and use local vendors as much as we can and those types of things. And so because of that, um, I think we're a good, quality, or a good candidate to utilize purchasing cards and it would help us and, and help our teachers and make, make purchases. I just had one. Um, for reimbursement for gas mileage and stuff, is that going to stay the same? 
because I know like students use it as well when they're working for the school district. The mileage reimbursements will be about the only reimbursements we would do. You and I chatted a little bit after the board meeting last night. Of course, mm -hmm. if there's any kind of emergency types of reimbursements, if a teacher is on a trip, for instance, and and you know uses their best judgment and needs to you know, get off the road or or fuel up at a different place or, or that kind of thing and uses their own personal car, we would, we would certainly honor that. But we foresee those types of emergency situations as being few and far between, which would then say that mileage reimbursements would be handled the same way as they always have been. If a person is you know, on school business, we currently uh, reimburse the IRS rate. And that goes, that's district-wide, so I don't think, I don't So that doesn't anything. really change anything with that at all? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So if a teacher, oh, go ahead, Dan. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, so if a, if a teacher said that I need to purchase a textbook or, so, or a, you know, a copy of a textbook, um, so they would just, like, come to you guys and get a credit they would, card? They would put in a, you know, they would put, uh, in, put in a requisition for, um, you know, the amount of money that a textbook would would cost. Yeah. You know, in this case, I mean, textbooks are pretty expensive. In our example, we used fifty dollars. They needed one, and put in requisition for fifty dollars. That requisition would then place the charge ability. It's almost like a gift card if you've ever received okay. a gift card. Okay. We would the business office, the purchasing manager, which in this case is me, would then charge that gift card um, almost immediately for that amount of fifty dollars. And then it gives the purchaser, the teacher in this case, more flexibility as to when he or she needs to make that purchase. And how do they load that card? Uh, that's loaded electronically. Um, and so uh, we foresee, we haven't actually loaded it yet because we haven't utilized the program. But, um, you know, I can foresee us on a daily basis getting, you know, a handful, let's say we get 10 requisitions to load that card that myself or Alice would um, you know, spend a half hour on the computer and just load every you know, particular person's card. So they have that to part. come in here to pick up the card? No, it's done electronically. electronically. They do their requisitions electronically. Okay. So they wouldn't have to. And, and if once they get a card, if they're a frequent purchaser, for instance, once they get a card, they can hold on to that card. It may not have any value oh, to it. Okay, you just But they could have it all year long. Mm -hmm. all, all year long. Okay. okay. I see. <clears throat> So my, I guess I have kind of an overall question. Sure. Um, the old system with all the paper trail is really cumbersome mm -hmm. and time consuming. And the new system is quick and efficient. But I guess my overall question is, um, is the financial oversight, the internal controls, are they, are they as good if you don't have that paper trail and you get into a situation where you have uh, financial abuse, financial fraud? Sure. Because most of that is not someone else grabbing the card and doing something that they shouldn't. It, it happens internally with employees. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the, the potential for finding, the financial controls are generally thought from an auditing standpoint to be tighter. And the reason of why is what we want to do is we want to get away from um, unauthorized purchases in our financial controls. So teachers, we want to try to get away from it, a situation where a teacher sees a textbook, makes the decision to buy that textbook, buys that textbook utilizing their own funds, sending in the receipts to us to get reimbursement for that. Because what that does, it um, teachers are not authorized to spend taxpayer dollars. Um, they need to get prior approval for that. So to answer your question, the purchasing card problem or issue um, eliminates that problem because uh, they ask for pre-approval for the particular materials of that, so they do get pre-authorization. But then it still allows them to control by the particular textbook that they need. The other area of controls that um, most people are, get concerned about is the um, purchaser, let's say, charging their card for $50 in our example, and then going and buying gas um, at a Texaco from their own vehicle. Okay, that would be a situation of fraud. We combat that by having a purchasing card agreement that is signed by each of the employees that utilize a card that talk about personal responsibility for the use of that card. Then immediately, also, we're alerted to the, that process. So as soon as that purchase gets made, we report the very next day as to where that purchase gets made. And it ties in with a particular card. So if there's 
an unauthorized vendor or an unauthorized type of purchase uh, than we're alerted to it. Literally the next business day. So we foresee it to be a little bit tighter. So, um, then, and you have an electronic trail, obviously, mm -hmm. transaction trail. Okay. Is that secure? Can that be altered or deleted? Or You know, that's interesting that uh, you asked that question because Andy and I uh, were part of the uh, Rotary Club and the treasurer for um, Marion County came and spoke today about the Electronic um, Records Monitoring Act, and I'm butchering that name. Um, but it's a requirement that um, for people that actually take credit cards, they have to process those credit cards in a very um, uh, strict and controlled manner. And, and like if you get a credit card to a restaurant, you know, they can't keep your card number and they have to have certain things that, you know, the merchant bank account does and those types of things. So those controls are, are becoming more and more strict all the time. So, you know, is it is it in theory possible for somebody to come in and alter some of those records? Well, you know, I think Target is a perfect example. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that the Target CEO probably did think that it was possible, but I, I guess it would be possible for that to happen. But again, I think that financial controls exist to not just stop the potential for fraud, but if there is a potential for fraud, alert us to that fraud potential sooner than later so we're not looking at it going through stacks of purchase orders that are no. yeah. I'm just feet instead of inches. I'm just curious about that because once again most fraud occurs internally, not mm -hmm. someone hacking into your system and taking yeah. things. It occurs um, by employees and then attempts are usually made to erase the records. Yes. So that's what I want to know. Oh, like it or erase the records for right. well in this case. So we're keeping if if we if we go this route, we're keeping an electronic transaction record trail. Mm -hmm. Well and most and, and in that particular case of, of financial controls, the multiple eyes that see the that see the uh, the transaction. So we have one individual that charges the card with the requisition. We have another individual that approves that position or that purchase. Another individual that charges that uh, card, another person purchasing it, then the receipts and the reconciliation of the bank statement. So that's called a, um, a broad based and multiple eyes approach. To it. So we will utilize that okay. directly. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, this is an action item. Is there a motion for approval? Move for approval. Second. For resolution 616, 2014. Moved and moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, our second action item: Approved day CPM services of Beaverton as district facility construction program manager. I know Andy and Irv and Dustin Hone and Joel worked on this. Yeah, we can address any questions that uh, you may have. There, I did list a copy of their, the uh, day CPM submission in front of you if you uh, would, uh, had a chance to look at that would like to look at that. We also have a couple of representatives from day CPM here this evening, uh, and uh, Mike Day and uh, Bob Collins. And I, I know some of you are familiar with Bob, uh, uh, was with the National before. He, he's now with day CPM. Uh, and um, so the... Uh, they they were they were one of uh, they were one of a couple of submissions. Thanks to Irv and, and others for helping with the screening committee and the selection committee. I I think the CPM has uh, uh, what it takes and the expertise, especially related to school management, in order to uh, do as you've discussed tonight. Put together a plan uh, using the information that we have available to you. So I I wasn't here at the last meeting, but could you just tell me uh, just for the record how sure. how did we solicit? Um, for applicants. Submissions. For decision. Do we have just advertise yeah. it or did we do a request for proposals? Yeah, we did a full RFP, uh, which was submitted. Uh, it was uh, published in the Daily Journal of Com Commerce. We also put it on the district website. Uh, we actually made individual calls to um, in any uh, company that submitted uh, proposals uh, a year and a half ago. So each of them received a personal invitation as well. Uh, had a pre-mandatory pre-proposal meeting for any interested parties, and then multiple parties attend that, uh, and then ultimately got the submissions brought the committee together, uh, made the selection, and here we are. 
Great. How many submissions were there? There were two formal submissions. Other questions? Okay. Is there a motion? Move for approval. Second. Second. <laughs> it's moved and seconded to approve Day CPM as our district facility construction program manager. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you, you guys. I'll be seeing a lot of you, I'm sure. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, and with nothing further, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.